Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Washington Cathedral Live. Uh, before we get started in worship, I just want to encourage you all and let you know it's okay to be worshiping from home. It's, uh, it's some strange times with what's going on, but fortunately we have the capacity to be able to worship as a community, even from our couches. So uh, why don't you grab a cup of coffee, gather your family around, and let's all worship together. Some of the cutest neighbor kids in the world, and uh, one, uh, Benjamin's uh, six years old, and uh, JJ's four years old. He just turned four. And um, JJ, little JJ came riding over on his bicycle so fast, saying, Tim, Tim, Tim. And then he climbed over our fence. We keep the, the uh, social distancing. I like to call it physical distancing. And, but they climb up the fence when they talk to us. And he said, you need to watch out for the coronavirus today. <laughs> and I said, okay, we will. And his mom is a, a, has her doctorate degree as a research scientist in immunology. And so they're very aware. But they just buzz over so fast and so enthusiastic that they can't help but cheer us up. And there are things in your life, too, that are cheering you up. Because God blesses us in the most chaotic times of crisis. That's been the story of life on this planet for many, many years. And you have experienced it before, and you'll experience it again if you'll let God bless you. He's there reaching out. This day is there for everyone, for Christians, for non-Christians, for believers, for non-believers, uh, for people that are taking a nap and for people that aren't. It's there for every person, every uh, bird, every, and they're singing joy, the birds are this morning. Uh, it's for all of us to enjoy that it's just a fact. Today is the day that the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We've been on a series of messages that I've entitled Jesus on Life, because Jesus has a lot to say us say to us about living. We took a few weeks talking about um, how we can party in the midst of uh, challenging times. And Jesus' mission was, he said, I came that you might have life, you might have it more abundantly. And the purpose of life isn't to party, but uh, when you follow Jesus Christ, and you do the things, it's quite a party. And he blesses us with joy and laughter. And we've had laughter on mission trips. We've had laughter at board me meetings. Uh, we have laughter when we're out working in the yard. It's the way that we're designed to enjoy life. But Jesus gets deeper with this whole issue. And in Matthew chapter uh, 6 and 7, if you'll look in your Bibles and, and turn there with me, it's Jesus telling us about life. And boy, does it speak to this very day. The very beginning of it, it says in Matthew chapter 6, I'm reading from the New International uh, Version. There's so much that it says. But in verse 25, Jesus says in this uh, recorded first sermon of Jesus Christ, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and it says, Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. You wonder what Jesus would say if he was in the living room with you today? He'd bring up the subject. Look, I'm telling you, don't worry. Don't panic. Don't have fear. Get right to the issue. Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink. And boy, are we worried about that. We go to the grocery store and try to get as much as we can. And sometimes people do it to excess. Or about your body, what you'll wear? Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Now Jesus isn't saying that you should never eat because you have to eat to live. And, and I believe he's not saying that you shouldn't wear clothes because I believe in wearing clothes. Um, and it'd be a, 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 a hard thing if we had to look at everyone without their clothes on. Um, and it says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap, or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour of your life? I can just almost hear the tone of Jesus' voice because I've had people that have spoken this into my life. They've lived this an example to my life. Yesterday was a a day of a graduation of someone in our church, the very first person ever to come to Washington Cathedral 35 years ago, Marianne S. and her husband, Earl, were the first people to come to our first service in uh, uh, the Bellevue um, Hotel, and it was the Red Lion at the time. And I think we had eight people at that time, but they're the first pe persons that said they're going to come. And, and they lived in, in Seattle, and and I remember Earl was, a, I think, a colonel in the Air Force. And he said, don't count on us coming all the time. I hate that traffic. But they came all the time. 
And Marianne, even after Earl passed away, she was just a joyful part of our Pace Setters congregation and, and helped with so many funeral dinners. And she was always, like her daughter Linda, so peaceful and yet so strong. Have you ever seen that combination in someone? Well, she graduated on to heaven yesterday. I heard about it with one of her uh, grandsons who posted it. And um, she had been such an inspiration to all of our lives here at Washington Cathedral because of just exactly what Jesus was talking about. She lived. In the times of crisis, she was peaceful. Doesn't mean that she didn't feel things, but she was also strong. She had a poise that influenced her whole family, that influenced her whole church. And I couldn't help but just say thank you throughout the day yesterday for Marianne S. You've all had people in your lives, somewhere, sometime, someplace, that have exhibited the very words of Jesus that seem so impossible, so otherworldly when he says, uh, why do you worry about these things? Why would you panic about such things? God's going to take care of you, just like he takes care of the birds or the flowers. There's a natural order of things. I've been sing singing in response to all the panic on the news and everything. I've been singing um, in every season uh, that famous uh, rock song from, the, I think, the 60s. And Jackie just hates that song. And so she says, will you quit singing that song? At least quit singing it with a British accent. It just sounds better when I sing it with a British accent. <laughs> it's going to drive Jackie crazy. But there's a time to laugh. There's a time to cry. So it's different seasons. But God's blessing us in every season of life. So Jesus would speak to you today. If you were in your living room, he didn't need the television. He came to visit you and knocked on your door, came in and sat on your couch. You poured him a cup of coffee. He would say to you, why do you worry about so much? Calm down. But he'd also tell you to fire up. See, some people get it mixed up. They either go one way or the other. Look at our society. Some people are so calm that they're out spreading the illness, right? They, they forget about the, the physical distancing that we're supposed to have. And, and uh, that's too calm. And the, the governor of Washington spoke very poignantly to that last Friday. And some people are so fired up to do something and make a difference. And I'm so thankful, as Rich prayed for the healthcare workers, those doctors and nurses and medical technicians and all the other people that are involved, they're really risking their lives. Some of them are coming down with the illness, but they're risking their lives to care for us. They're fired up. I'm glad that they're fired up to make a difference. You know, so many stories throughout history. This isn't the first time that we've ever had an epidemic. And throughout history, there was the uh, Black Death, which wiped out, um, what, half of the population, some people estimate, to a quarter of the population. There were smallpox epidemics. There was the bubonic plague that hit, even in Athens, so many centuries ago, um, even before um, uh, Christ had come. There were plagues and diseases that would come, and people had to go through those. You know, the founding of one of our great hospitals, and I'm praying for all the hospitals in the United States and around the world, it was Bellevue Hospital was the first hospital in the, in the uh, public hospital in the United States. That's not Bellevue, Washington, where we live, but it's Bellevue back east. And the founding physician of that, they were, at, they were at their strength early on because we had the yellow fever epidemic. And I can't recall his name right now, but you can uh, look it up. You can Google it right after this. Uh, I have a name in my mind, but if I, I guess, I might be wrong. And so uh, he was there, and he served, just like the doctors and nurses are now, he served while the yellow fever hit, and he lost his son to yellow fever. He lost his wife to yellow fever. He lost his mom to yellow fever. And he lost his brother to yellow fever. And someone asked him, why do you keep doing this? Why do you keep coming to work? Why are you helping people? And he said, which has been a tradition of this great hospital, he said, I just believe that God put us on earth here to help people. So I'm doing what God wants me to do. And there's a sense of every physician, regardless of their religion, or their, their formal theological beliefs, that they have a purpose, they have skills, and they can make a difference. And we should thank God for their courage and how much they're making, difference they're making. We need to calm down, but we need to fire up. So Jesus said um, later on, there's so much in this Sermon on the Mount where he talks about don't judge others. I could have a whole sermon on that, couldn't I? Um, but he goes on in verse 7 of chapter 7 when he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, 
and the door will be open to you. So you're not just being calm and not worrying about everything, you're actually asking, seeking, and knocking. I talked about some of the plagues that we've had on this planet. Well, one of them that's in recent memory um, of our parents' generation was the TB plague that we had in the United States. I have an aunt that she's very intelligent. She has her doctorate degree in psychology, in clinical psychology, and she's written a book about her experiences as a child, and actually my uncle's experience, and my mom never, never got it, but she was a, a, the baby of the family at that time. But my Aunt Susan was five years old when she came down with TB. Well, first, my Uncle Sam, who's a great professor and mathematician, um, he came down when he was seven, and he almost died. And there wasn't money to go to the uh, sanitariums that they had. And the best one was in um, Salem, Oregon, because they, they were from Oregon, from uh, Eagle Valley, Oregon, who was where they were living at the time. And it was because of the, the SEALs program, the, where people would give uh, gifts for these little stickers, that he was able, poor kids were able to go to the sanitariums to get better. When he got there to the sanitarium in um, uh, Salem, he thought for sure he was going to die. The first thing they did, according to my mom, was they gave him a book about heaven. And that's not a good sign to a kid who just checks into a hospital. Uh, he was smart enough to figure that one out. But even one of the doctors, the lead doctors that cared so much, said, just put him in my arms. I'll, I'll hold this little baby, this little boy, until he dies because he's so sick. Well, he was there for nine months in the middle of all these other children at the Salem San San uh, Sanitarium. And during that time, my Aunt Susan, who was five, came down with it. And can you imagine how traumatic it was? Well, she wrote a book, and I encourage you to read it. Um, and uh, she wrote a book about this whole experience. It's so dramatic, where at five years of age, she was taken to the sanitarium, and she just cried. She couldn't see her brother. He was in a different part of the hospital. And she cried, and she cried, and she cried, until finally they let her go in and see her big brother, who was seven years old. And she came in, I talked to her on the phone last night, because uh, I need to reread the book. But she kneeled down by her brother's bed, and her big brother took her hand, and he said, don't worry, little sister. We're going to get through this. We'll be all right. That's the kind of calmness that we need to have and strength. Now, faith doesn't mean that you close your eyes when you're driving. I hope that you understand that's not what faith means. Faith means you open your eyes. Faith means that you think that you can make a difference by driving well, by following the, the laws, and um, by watching out for other people, driving defenses, defensively and, and everything else, but being as smart as you can be. And that's exactly what they're doing. As their very created sense, that's what Jesus points to for the birds, that they, they don't know how to speak, they can sing like nobody's business, but the very created sense was that God was going to take care of them. So I love the, the robins this time of year when they begin to sing. I, I could imitate it right now, but I won't put you through that. <laughs> they wake you up at the dawn. Now, you could go out, if you can interview a robin and say, uh, Robin, do you have all the food that you need? Do you have all the toilet paper stored away? Uh, do you have uh, your financial plan for retirement? And they wouldn't, wouldn't know anything about that. But they would sing in response to all of creation. That's what Jesus is pointing to. Calm down. Fire up. Ask. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. Don't you hope that all the research scientists is so encouraging to hear uh, about the rapid tests that they've come up with, about some of the other medication, antiviral medications that may be able to battle the illness and how we're just a year away from a vaccine and there's several different approaches to the vaccine. Don't you hope that they don't, aren't too calm that they fire up, <laughs> that they're asking and seeking and knocking, just like the words of Jesus? Now, I know some uh, scholars will look at this passage and say, well, the words of Jesus here sound like the words of Buddha because maybe they studied together and who knows what happened in the quiet years of Jesus. But maybe they both say the same thing about mindfulness, about um, not being over panicked and, and so full of fear that you can't concentrate in the day. Maybe they both say that because it's the truth for all humanity. Jesus said, why do you worry about tomorrow? In the Old Testament, God revealed himself and, and Moses said, what's your name? And, and he said, I am that I am, Yahweh. It means um, I'm not yesterday, I'm not about tomorrow, I'm about today, I'm about living in this moment. I'm the God who meets you in the moment. And it's not I was that I was, or I'm going to be that I'm going to be. I am that I am. 
God wants to meet us in the moment right now. He wants to give us the strength that all of us need and the joy. Now, there are so many good things that are going to come out of this crisis. There are best-selling books that are going to be written that you wouldn't have written if it wasn't because you had to shelter in place or stay at home. And um, what else are you going to do? Some of you will remodel your houses. You've been meaning to do that for years. Some of you might even write a physical letter to another person. All of us are going to be more in contact with the people around us. I'm so thankful that our neighbors are doing that. For us, they just bring so much joy into our lives. One more story about my two cute little neighbors is the other day, uh, Jackie and I are coming back from the doctor, and both of them are out working so diligently with their dad out in their front yard. And I said to their dad, I said, boy, you've got two good workers there. And little JJ that's four years old stopped working. He just came running over as fast as he can without moving his arms or, his, or anything. He was just being very... Uh, unusual in the way that he ran. And he came running over and he said, he whispered to me, he said, Tim, we're not working. We're in trouble for putting dirt on the gravel and we're picking it back up. And I said, well, I'm glad you clarified that, JJ. And so he rushed back to get to work. Now, this isn't a time for social distancing. That's what we call it. Maybe physical distancing is better. But I'm so thankful for all the technology that we have. I'm thankful for those that invented it that put their lives on the line and their money on the line to develop these things, but we can call someone on a phone from anywhere. We don't have to have the wall phone or the pay phone. We can use our cell phone and call someone and make better friends with them than we would have if we hadn't gone through this. We can FaceTime. We can contact them with text or emails. And we should be doing all of that because it isn't just social distancing. It's physical distancing for safety but we need to be alert and ready. And if you're listening to me, you're still awake during the sermon, uh, please contact those that you love because they need to stay in contact with you. I called um, my daughter, uh, Elise, and her two kids, and I said, how are you doing through this whole thing? And she said, well, it's day two of staying at home, and, and we're done with this. We can't go another day. <laughs> and her kids were literally climbing up and, to see me and everything. And I said, well, you better learn how to enjoy this. And that's true for all of us, isn't it? Uh, There was an interesting article about our very area here um, that you might have seen. In fact, I called Tony Wood to make sure that it wasn't his uh, relative. But a lady that they said in the interview that she was the uh, oldest person to survive um, the coronavirus so far. And I was telling my dad, and he said he heard of someone that was 100. But she was 90 years old, and she was living at, lived for a a long time at the Kirkland Care Center, which was the uh, point, the beginning of the whole um, epidemic here, and half of the people passed away there, and they used to say, boy, if you're older, you don't have a chance. She's 90 years old, and she's recovering from coronavirus. Her grandchildren were so proud of her as they spoke to the press, and they told her, and they said, well, what do you think made them recover? And they said, I think it was potato soup. She came back from the hospital, and all that she wanted was potato soup. At first, they wouldn't let her have it, and she she didn't need it. Then later, they let her have it, and then she got better when she had potato soup. And the doctors were coming in to talk to her and visit with her, and all of them wanted the family recipe for potato soup. Don't you like that kind of defiant optimism and faith? That's what Jesus was courageous to do. Calm down. Don't worry about tomorrow. Look at nature. See how God runs nature. Ask, seek, knock. It's part of our humanity to do what we can do during this time, even if we're stuck at home. God still has a plan for us. Well, we love you and we miss you and we look forward to the day when we'll all be worshiping together. This thing going to be a great day and looking out on that waterfall and someone in the church will begin the service by saying, today is the day that the Lord hath made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. That's going to be a great day. So Jackie's going to, my wife Jackie's here, and she's going to come up and lead us in a time of of group prayer.